What is going on everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. And if this is your first time here, my name is Richard, and this is the channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. So subscribe for all kinds of content just like this if you haven't already, and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. This is another video in my R tutorial series, and specifically it's part two in a series of videos I'm doing on Carrot which is a one-stop shop for all of your machine learning needs. So if you haven't seen part one yet, I highly recommend watching that one before this one. The link will be up above in a card as well as in the description of this video. But basically in part one, we covered some of the steps that are necessary before you even think about training models and things like that. So some general formatting of the data, visualizing the distributions of different variables by your response variable, identifying near zero variance features, and we left off with pre-processing the data. So things like imputing missing data, one hot encoding the data set so that you have a one nice consistent format for these factor variables, and then normalizing all the variables. And so where we're gonna pick off in this part of the tutorial is applying these same transformations to the test set. Because remember, we started with applying these transformations to the training set. We need to do the exact same thing to the test set. So before we get started here, hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm. I'll have a link in the description of the video to my Patreon account. If you guys would be willing to support me over that way, that would be massively appreciated. And as always, this script is available on my GitHub repo and that will obviously be in the description too. So let's take a minute to remember exactly what's going on in the pre-processing stages. So when we use this pre-process function here, we pass a method to it. And remember, there's three things that we want to do. We want to impute the missing data using a bagging approach. We want to use this dummy vars function, which is essentially doing the exact same thing to perform one hot encoding that gets all of our factor variables into the same general format. And then at the end, we want to normalize. So we want to transform our variables to a zero one scale. And that's where method equals range comes into play. Well, the output when we run the preprocess or the dummy vars function, the output of that is actually the transformation. We can then apply that transformation to our data using the predict function. So all we did was just go through a similar procedure three times, one for bag impute, one for dummy vars, and one for uh, method equals range. We did that three times, and along the way, the response variable class got dropped, so we had to add that back in. Well, okay, we already have all these transformations applied and we've already applied all of them to our training set. Now all we have to do is apply the exact same transformations to the test set. So if we just go one by one, we use the predict function for this bag missing transformation we've defined that imputes our missing data, pass in the test set. We have a new test set object. Do the same thing for the dummy model for the one hot encoding. Do the same thing for the range model for the uh, normalization. Then along the way, the output turns into a matrix. We want data frames here, so I'm gonna transform this back into a data frame. And then just like ha what happened in the uh, training set, the response variable got dropped, so we're going to add that back in. Now, just as one last step here, it's possible that the names get kind of changed around and it's not consistently applied from the training set to the test set. That is the transformations can get applied a little bit differently and the names can get messed up. So it's helpful just to prevent future errors down the road. Just run this last line of code here to make sure the names are the same. With that, we're ready to rock and roll. Now one final pre-processing step you should be aware of is how you go about removing low information features. Now a low information feature is not necessarily the same thing as a zero variance feature. A zero variance feature is a type of low information feature, but it's not the only kind. And just as a general rule, if you have a lot of useless, uninformative variables in your data set, it is going to harm your performance. Now, I'm gonna show you an algorithmic way that you can go about removing uninformative variables. It's called recursive feature elimination. 
But as a general rule, I'd actually like to caution you away from this approach, just because I like letting the domain expertise handle how you eliminate variables. Having said that, recursive feature elimination is a pretty streamlined and algorithmic and consistent way that you can go about removing low information features, so we're going to cover it here even if I'm not necessarily going to use it here. So at a high level, the basis for recursive feature elimination is the fact that several different methods out there provide ways of ranking variables from most to least important. For instance, with linear models, you can use the absolute value of the t statistic, random forest provides variable importance ranking, so on and so forth. There are several other examples. So what we're going to do here is we're going to build many models of whatever machine learning method that we want to use on the training set, and we start with an initial ranking of these variables from most to least important. Now, Again, we're going to use multiple models, and at every step, we're going to iteratively recalculate the most important variables. It's just up front, we're going to have priority to what variables have we found to be the most important up front. We're going to use subsets of all the available variables, and actually you can specify this up front. For instance, I want to use 1 through 5 variables, as well as 10, 15, 20. And now, here's how we're going to set this up. We're going to use this RFE control function. And now this first argument here, functions, is going to allow us to determine what type of method that we want to use. So if you go to the help documentation, you can see uh, how to specify this. Scroll down to the bottom here where it specifies the details, and it lays out that you can use LM functions for linear models, RF functions for random forest, tree bag, as well as NB functions, where the NB stands for uh, naive bays. But we're going to set this up, and what it's going to output for us is the most important variables. So this code does take a little bit of time to run. I want to give you fair warning of that. But at the end, it's going to output for us the top five variables out of the ones that were uh, iterated through. We've got employment duration, amount, property, real estate, telephone.1, and age. Now, like I said before, I'm not going to use this information, but there are certainly instances in which doing an approach like this is going to help you out. So it's just something to have on your radar as a possible approach. All right, now we're going to get into the moment that everybody's been waiting for, which is we're going to train our first model using caret. And we're going to do that using the simply named train function. Now, I can't even begin to express to you guys how powerful this function is and how much it does just within one single function. So one of the arguments to the train function is this thing called tr control. Now, this takes in a training control object. We're going to see this later. But that training control object controls for how we tune our hyperparameters. Within this same function, we're also going to cross-validate the model and select an optimally performing model based on our metric of choice. So, extremely powerful function, and we're going to see it in action in a minute here. And we're also going to return the variable importance plot from one single uh, method, what was kind of going on in the back end when we did the recursive feature elimination. But before we do that, it's good to get an idea of the full scope of models that can be trained using Carrot. Um, now, several of these are going to require installation of separate packages, but if you run the get model info function and then just call the names of that, you get an idea of just how many methods that we can call, and as you see, this is an absolutely massive list. So there's a lot that we can do, but we're going to start with one of my absolute favorite machine learning methods, which is the random forest. For our first time taking the train function for a spin, I'm not going to do any kind of fancy configuration to it whatsoever. I'm going to specify the bare minimum configurations here, and then just let the train function figure out the best way it wants to train this model. So on the first line here, I'm just going to set the seed for reproducibility purposes. Now to the train function, I have to specify the formula. Remember, class is our response variable. I want to use all the variables in the data set, so I use this shorthand notation of the tilde followed by the, uh, the period here. 
the data is the training set. And then for method, we specify RF, where RF stands for random forest. Now, if we call this thing that we just trained, there's a lot of helpful summary information that gets outputted. So for instance, we have 700 samples, that is 700 rows, 20 predictors, that is 20 columns, two classes, bad and good. And now it says no pre-processing here because we didn't do the pre-processing directly in the train function. So that's a little bit misleading because we did pre-process. Uh, for resampling, it used bootstrapping. And then you've got the resampling results across tuning parameters. So in the resampling results, we have different values for the mTry parameter. And then on average, how is the accuracy and how is the kappa metric? So kappa is actually typically a better choice to use for our metric for selecting the optimal model when we have class imbalance. But by default, the train function is going to use the accuracy metric for selecting the optimal model. And we see that on average, when mTry was 11, the accuracy was 0.7195. That's the highest accuracy across these different values of mTry. And so that's the final value that this model object is going to use is mTry equals 11. So we're going to see how this thing actually did. But first, for this one iteration of this model, we're going to look at the variable importance. Now, as I discussed when we were talking about recursive feature elimination, random forest is one of several methods that you can train using caret that provide an inherent mechanism for ranking our variables from most to least important. So all we have to do is create a variable importance object using this uh, function varimp. Obviously that stands for variable importance. Create that object, and then we're just gonna create a plot of that. I give it a title here, German credit variable importance, in parentheses, random forest, and then we have a plot of the most to least important variables with amount and age and employment duration sticking at the top here. Now, you wanna be really cautious with interpreting these things with random forest, and I have a whole video uh, titled When Should You Use Random Forests, which has a lengthy discussion on this. I can't get into all that here out of an interest of time. Uh, but at least you know now how you go about creating a variable importance plot because just as a gut check or common sense kind of thing that you can do and share with people in terms of things that make sense, variable importance is a great thing to report. So the last thing that we're going to do in this video is we're going to use that model that we've trained to generate predictions for our testing set, okay? All we have to do is use the predict function where the first argument is that model that we've trained and the second argument is our testing set. Now the output of this function is just going to be a vector of the predicted classes. So it goes bad, good, 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 bad, good. And we're going to see later in this tutorial series, we can generate our output to be probabilities instead but the simplest way and the default way to do this is just to output the predicted classes. The best way to summarize how we did is via the confusion matrix function. So the key arguments here are reference and data. Reference is going to provide us the true class values. Obviously that just comes from the class variable from the test set and then the predicted values. We just generated those. We stored them in this fitted vector. So we're going to pass that to the data argument. And then you're going to want to specify the positive class. The positive class is just good. So we're going to run that and we get all this amazing looking output here. In the next video, we're going to step through how you interpret the most important pieces of this output then we're going to be a little bit more deliberate about how we tune the hyperparameters as we train our model. So I'll leave you all there. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, consider sharing it, hit the like button, then I'll see you all in the not so distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.